Um, again, thank you for the opportunity to, to speak to you today. It's a, a great pleasure. Wayne's always a very hard act to follow. His talks are always very interesting and I always learn something. Um, I envy the range of illustrations he could use. Um, I mean, I guess I could put a picture of an eviscerated rat in my talk, but I don't think too many people would be terribly um, keen on that. So not as many photos, I'm afraid. Um, Wayne started off by putting genetic engineering in a historical context so that you can actually understand how it fits in the broader continuum uh, of the food of food production. I want to do something a little similar in terms of the regulatory requirements for GM crops uh, in the context of the history of um, uh, regulatory requirements for new technologies. Um, I want to look also not so much at a catalogue of what different uh, regulatory jurisdictions require, but some of the problems that come from ex an excessive precaution or a lack of understanding of historical context and what we actually do know uh, when we're actually designing the, um, the nature of the regulation that, that surrounds um, new technologies. This is a slide that I, I show in, in talks on, on a number of technologies actually. Uh, we often look at things as new when really it's just an old wine and a new bottle. Um, it's been, this is a comment that's been around in various forms for, for a very long time. If you don't actually pay attention to his, history, if you're just not interested enough to go and read what we've learned from previous experiences, you tend to make the same mistakes. A lot of what we present as new technology is really a continuum of old technologies and that's true whether you're using a new form of irradiation to process a food rather than heat radiation, you're using gamma radiation. Uh, whether you're using genetic engineering, which is really just a more sophisticated aspect of, of conventional um, plant breeding, or whether you're looking at nanotechnologies, which in fact have been around an extraordinarily long time. So what is thought to be novel often turns out to be a subset or a special case of pre-existing knowledge. All right, first of all, what constitutes good regulation. How would we recognise good regulation if we actually looked at it? The first question is why are we going to do it at all? Why are we going to have a regulatory environment at all? The minimalist approach, and it exists in, in a lot of consumer um, regulation if you like, is to say that it's the responsibility of the producer to make sure the product is safe. And so you only introduce regulations for specific subsets of the design and production and supply of a product where the market fails. So why don't we do that in, in all food regulation? Well, there's been a few public safety issues that have occurred over the years which have caused a great deal of harm to a great number of people um, and there's a great reluctance to leave it to the market to get that right. It's important to understand that risk assessment guides the risk management or it should guide risk management. In some jurisdictions it seems to be the risk managing guides the outcomes of risk assessments or certainly the inputs to risk assessment. Another reason we have regulation though, particularly in the food space, is public confidence. The public will not adopt and consume new technologies unless it has confidence in the safety of that uh, food supply. On a broader issue, if you think of the massive sizes of our modern cities, they are utterly dependent on long transport chains um, complex supply lines, a wide variety of technologies to supply that food. If people lost confidence in, in that food supply, um, it could actually undermine the viability of modern society. Politics obviously influences the range of regulations. We might think it shouldn't and in some jurisdictions it influences it to a much greater extent than in others. Um, I'm not going to talk terribly much about the politics. I want to stick to the first couple of items. Okay, general principles. What's good regulation? Ethical regulation should be proportionate to the risk. So reg ideally the regulatory requirements should be evidence-based. The data tells you what the issues are, ideally, and you respond to that. The regulatory burden should be commensurate with the risk to be managed. And the data requirements should address viable risk management options. There's no point asking for data if you can't use the information that's been provided to manage some risk or respond to some risk or to identify a risk that is manageable by the risk management. This is where the value of information analysis comes in. 
Data is only necessary where the information has a material influence on the outcome. There's no point asking for information if it cannot possibly change the risk management outcomes from the risk analysis process. It's important to understand that a precautionary approach is not necessarily precautionary. The regulatory environment is very much like ecology. If you change one thing in uh, an ecosystem, multiple events will occur from that, and you can't predict those. It's a bit like throwing a pebble into a pond with a bunch of reeds around the outside. You know, the, the nice neat rings from where you threw the pebble aren't nice neat rings by the time they get to the, to the outside of the pond because there's all these interferences. When you change anything, when you require anything, you influence the way business responds, the types of products they invest in, um, where investment goes, and it can have ramifications way beyond the specific point that you've made a change to. So if you're taking an excessively precautionary approach and managing a risk that doesn't exist, there can be a wide range of outcomes that are unpredictable and may have much greater negative consequences than the theoretical risk that you are taking a precautionary approach to. This was a topic that was discussed uh, to a considerable extent in the last uh, annual meeting, meeting at Ilse, so I'm not proposing to go th to touch on that uh, more than I just have, except uh, for one point which I'll make in the next slide. But overall, the general principle for uh, good regulation is it should be balanced, proportionate, pragmatic, cost-effective, should be impartial, and most importantly, maintain scientific integrity. And this is not, unfortunately, always true in some jurisdictions. So building public confidence requires a lot more than just getting the outcome of the risk assessment right. There's a whole range of things that need to be considered. And I think there we need to make sure that we have the appropriate disciplines involved in the whole regulatory environment to make sure that we are actually covering that public confidence issue. One of the key things that uh, maintains public confidence is conveying the reality of scientific consensus around the safety uh, of uh, new technologies. Often the consensus is there, but it's just not conveyed. Equally, it's important to try and achieve regulatory consensus because discordance in regulatory direction and regulatory requirements uh, tends to get used by various protagonists to uh, drive uncertainty in the, in the community. Okay, so now let's put it into a bit of a historical context. And I'm choosing food irradiation because there are some very, very close parallels in what happened with food irradiation and a lot of the excessive data requirements and regulatory burdens that are placed on GMOs today. Now I'm not going to go through this entire table, but it's a, an outline of the events um, and the history of food irradiation. And the key points is that very soon after irradiation uh, was actually discovered by Becquerel, there were suggestions, well, gee, we could use this. You know, we could use this to sterilise food or process food or whatever. So it came out with all of the hype about the possibilities before the new technology was fully understood. And you very often see that, and there's a lot of commercial uh, imperatives involved in why that occurs. But to be honest, the evidence base that we have now, say, in GMOs, to defend the technology as safe, has, is actually relatively recently been supported by the new information that we've been able to develop. But the other thing to point out is it took about 60 years from the time uh, food irradiation was proposed before it started to be generally accepted. And there are still groups that will choose any possible angle to argue against food irradiation, even though we have a, a huge body of knowledge uh, to support its safety. The sort of concerns that have been raised are also analogous to the concerns that you see with, with GMO uh, crops. People are worried about reduced nutrition. They're worried about production of unintended and unknown toxic carcinogenic genetic, uh, radiolytic products in this case, or induced radioactivity, which is not really analogous to GMOs, but um, was a concern that was raised. And the responses was that of both scientists and people proposing, technologists proposing to use this new technology in regulators, was to look at analytical chemistry, but also to do toxicology studies of the whole irradiated food. And the logic is, well, I've irradiated this food, if I stick it in a rat and the rat doesn't show any problems, it's got to be safe. Okay? 
and it's a way of testing for those unintended unknowns. Okay. So what were the, the outcomes from all of the chemistry analysis that were done? Now these next few slides are taken from the uh, IAEA, FAO, WHO um, joint report, uh, expert report on the consequences of high dose radi uh, radiation of food on the wholesomeness and the safety of that food. And the conclusions were that um, all of the radiation products that they found um, were present in foods or produced in thermally produced foods anyway. So a lot of the concerns that people had, once you actually did the analyses and you worked through the chemistry and then you compared the irradiated food to the normal food, suddenly you found chemicals and substances in the normal food that you didn't know were there before, but the investigation into the irradiated food has highlighted their presence. The second thing they found that if you identified compounds in extreme experimental conditions, they were generally irrelevant to the safety assessment of normal foods processed in a normal way. So we, we see in, in the literature even today some pretty extreme experimental protocols which are claimed to show all sorts of things uh, but tend to be um, unrepresentative or just misinterpreted. The other thing they found is that the use of chemical analysis uh, was sufficient for granting broadly based generic approvals of high dose irradiated foods. And what they're really saying there is instead of approving an apple or even a Granny Smith apple that's been irradiated by a cobalt source you could actually approve all palm fruits that were irradiated from any source, just based on the chemistry and the knowledge that the, the irradiation chemistry was pretty much the same in any sort of related group of fruits, uh, regardless of the radiation source. So more generic types approvals. And this is something I'll come back to in the GMOs uh, area. Despite that, and, and the chemistry was actually developed relatively early in, in, in this process. This is just an example of one of uh, a, a large number of pages in that report of the tox studies that were done. So a large number of toxicology studies were done on uh, beef, beef jerky, um, smoked beef, uh, ham, pork, uh, bacon, whatever, in a rat, in a dog, in a cat, in a monkey, right? with a source from cobalt, uh, with a source of radiation from um, spent nuclear fuel rods, etc. Because there's got to be something wrong here and we, we're not getting it in the study, so let's just do another one. Maybe the species was wrong, you know, maybe the radiation source was wrong, or maybe if it was dried meat or wet meat or whatever. In the end, tens of thousands of experimental animals were sacrificed over about a 50 year period and they were rats and mice and dogs and primates and chickens and quail and a few others that I haven't, haven't put in there. And there were no results in all of those studies that wasn't predictable from a knowledge of the radiation chemistry. And where effects were actually seen in species they tended to be due to species specific sensitivities to specific nutrient deficiencies which were known to occur through radiation uh, from the radiation chemistry. So the conclusion of this expert meet, uh, group was that the determination of wholesomeness for representative food could be extrapolated to other foods of similar composition. So you don't have to test every single food. The chemical studies were the basis for safety assessment. And although there are a few unintended things that are, are, are produced, the way you understand the significance and the safety aspects, um, if there are any at all, uh, is through a consideration of the radiation chemistry, not through endless uh, animal studies. So although a vast range of studies were conducted on a wide range of animals, none of, the, and these are, this is a direct quote out of this expert group, none of the toxicological studies had produced evidence of adverse effects. And yet they continue to be dis to conducted despite knowledge of the nature and concentration of the radiolytic products that there was no evidence of a toxicological hazard. Indeed, in earlier deliberations, they saw the chemistry as the primary determinant of whether there was a safety issue or not, um, and the tox was seen as being supporting evidence for the chemistry, if it was evidence at all. Now, there was a great deal of criticism in earlier years, and, and this predates the, the expert report, um, of doing whole food studies. And that's where you give 
rats the entire food. You don't just take a fraction of it or try and work out which parts of it might have been altered and then concentrate it down. You're just giving them the, the, the whole food. And, and the key problems are the impossibility of physically or chemically identify what was being tested. When you're looking for unintended constituents, the food is just a carrier. And the unintended constituents might be there or they might not be there. There might be a lot of it, none of it, a little bit of it. You know, it could be any type of compound. You've got no idea what you're actually testing for. The inability to incorporate sufficient of the food into the animal diet without seriously disturbing the nutrition of the test animals, giving rise to second toxicological findings unrelated to the radiation effects. And this is also a very true issue uh, with GMOs. The obvious impossibility of using sufficiently large numbers of animals in each experimental group to permit ascribing with an acceptable degree of statistical confidence any observed variations to the effect of radiolytic products. So you've got very small amounts to see, a so you know, the power of a study is dependent on the magnitude of the effect you're looking at in comparison with the natural variation of whatever the, the, the endpoint is that, that's being affected. So if it's a very small effect, you're going to need huge numbers of animals to get any real statistical power uh, or interpretive power in those studies. And as he said, it's much more convincing to be able to state um, that certain likely effects have been searched for and found absent than to admit that you didn't know what you're looking for in the first place, but you didn't find it. Whatever it was, I didn't find it. I don't know what it was, but I didn't find it. Right? So now we move into the current situation with dream crops. Proportionality to risk. The current regulatory requirements in some jurisdictions are founded on discredited postulates. You know, 20 years ago, you could hypothesise all sorts of things and, you know, whilst they might have been a bit tenuous, you could excuse people, you know, in the absence of data and so on to raise these issues and say, well, look, you know, you really ought to be able to address these with the data that, that comes through. But because we're now continuing regulation in many jurisdictions on discredited postulates, the regulation is irrational, it's discordant with the data, and it's excessive. The value of information. There are some jurisdictions which require analysis of endogenous allergen levels. And yet, if the allergen level has gone up by twofold or down by 50%, it makes no difference to the risk management. You're not going to tell somebody who's allergic to peanuts that it's okay to eat a GMO peanut because it's only got 10% or 1% of the allergen in it. Because what happens if there's a peanut in there that's not GMO? And on earth would you manage that? All right? So it can't change the risk management. So what value has it? So why would you spend money on it? We also know that de novo generation of allergens and exclusion of introduced allergens might change risk management. But then you've got to ask, well, how plausible is that postulated outcome? And then you've got to go back to the original data to determine whether there is sufficient evidence to provide sufficient value for that analysis. So the current data requirements are jurisdiction dependent and there's a wide variation from theoretically very little data uh, through to quite excessive data requirements. And they fall into a number of areas. Now I'll grade out a few of these. The ones I want to focus on is compositional analysis, toxicology and allergenicity because if you like they are the more con uh, controversial but they also tend to be where the greatest expense in addition to normal development processes uh, tend to lie. This is a page out of a, a, a document a paper that we're currently preparing in Task Force 10, uh, hopefully soon to be going to a, um, a publisher. Just looking at the studies that have actually been conducted in animals on whole foods. You know, as we've discussed, they've got a lot of issues with whole food studies, but there's a lot of them. This is just a segment of the 90-day studies, there's 28-day studies, there's repro studies, and there's even some, uh, a few longer-term studies. So what was the predictability of the outcome? In no other field of toxicology, in no other uh, in vitro, in vivo analysis, do you get 100% concordance between the ex vivo or in vitro, in silico analysis and the outcomes in the tox studies? So in every single case, from a consideration of the agronomic characteristics and the gene that you've you've actually inserted into the plant and a knowledge of the plant, you would predict no toxicological outcome. And in every case, you get none. That's pretty unique. Unfortunately, um, it reflects the weakness of whole food studies 
and their largely uh, uninterpretable nature, but it also, of course, reflects the inherent safety of the process. There is negligible potential for accidental generation of unknown, unexpected toxic substances through gene insertion, as Wayne has you know, eloquently uh, covered for us already. Equally, bioassays have a high limit of detection. They are not, you know, a rat is a really, really poor substitute for a HPLC. Right? The way you get useful information out of a rat study is to push the dose to overcome interspecies differences, uh, to get a manifestation that is uh, unequivocally uh, uh, interpretable from the results of the study. And you can't do that with whole, whole foods. What about all those studies that purport to show harm? Well, I'm sure many of you are, are familiar with some of these. There's the Austrian study, uh, which was uh, a series of reproductive-related studies in mice. Uh, a number of um, food agencies, including the, the Australian New Zealand agency, of which I, was, I, I ran the risk assessment group there uh, until about a year ago. We had a look at it. We actually, the, the data was really well presented. The study was well conducted, or studies were well conducted. It was really well documented. It was the interpretation was rubbish. And when you looked at the data, it actually supported the safety of the crop that they, they um, tested. And when a few of these comments came out from Australia and EFSA and others, uh, it disappeared from the internet. It was never published in a peer-reviewed journal, but it was quickly removed uh, because the interpretation was the exact opposite of the motivation for doing the study, I would, would suspect. Um, so, no evidence. And in terms of the Seralini studies, the, the best I can say is that they can be used as bad examples in a teaching environment. What if a 90-day study was actually useful? Let's just take a flip side, play devil's advocate for a minute. How could it possibly be enough? How can a 90-day study cover all of the issues of species-specific pharmacokinetics, toxicodynamics, different physiology, biochemistry between species, the different life stages and your reproduction, carcinogenicity? A 90-day study could never be enough. And if it was enough, why don't we test pesticides the same way? We just spray the crop, harvest the crop, feed it to a rat, no problems, end of testing. Wouldn't that save a fortune? Gosh. <clears throat> Well, you know, I, I, uh, I never be, cease to be surprised by Europe, I'm afraid. Um, the European Commission is now actively seeking funding for two-year animal studies in uh, whole food studies. You know, I mean, I could give a whole day seminar on why these, these uh, types of studies really are um, just simply non-credible. And of course, when you look at what they're proposing to do, they're not going to test the same GM variety that was in the Seralini studies that caused so many problems. So there's a, a, an obvious um, angle for the protagonist to pick up, ah, it was the wrong, right? It was the wrong crop. So we're getting back into exactly the same process we saw with irradiated food. This crop in this location with this pesticide treatment in that species on this season in this continent. You know, how many tens of thousands of animals are we going to sacrifice for no good purpose? So, what tox data should you actually require, in my opinion, none on the whole food? There's not a single study that would call into question the adequacy, sufficiency or robustness of safety assessment based on agronomic or indoor compositional data. There may be a need, if you truly did produce a novel compound that you hadn't seen before or didn't know existed in nature elsewhere, then you may take, you know, isolate that and test it in a rat and that's a perfectly valid uh, study. You can do all of the the normal study design um, tricks to make it interpretable. But you'd use the pure substance of interest. Um, not only does the insistence on animal studies uh, not promote public confidence, but it actively undermines it. If you really need these studies, you know, anybody outside Europe would think, crikey, the, the, the Europeans are so worried about this stuff, they're going to do two-year studies. You know, that doesn't engender public confidence. In my opinion, there's no role in intractable proteins. The reason they're intractable is because they break down or they, they lose their activity as you uh, try to isolate them, which means that's exactly what's going to happen in, in the gut. Um, nutritional variation, well, that's easier done with HPLC and other techniques than it is in a rat. Um, and these, this idea of vague, discre discredited postulates of unintended unknowns really isn't supported by you know, the, the vast data we have of what actually goes on in plants um, when genes jump around. 
Well, what about compositional analysis? Well, even compositional analysis, uh, the scientific basis for that is highly questionable. And, and I think Wayne's talk has actually highlighted a lot of the reasons why that is uh, fairly questionable. It's hugely expensive, and there's no evidence that it adds anything to public health and safety. Um, there's not a single instance where a consideration of agronomic or compositional data revealed risks for commercial GM crops, not predictable from a knowledge of the parent line and the characteristics of the gene that you're transferring and its source. There's clear evidence, however, that there's considerable variation due to environment that often exceeds that of the transgene. Now, during GM crop development, you've also got the back crossing of the elite hybrid with the parent. All right, so you, you take your, your lead event and you back cross it to the, to the parent and every time you do that you reduce the amount of unintended changes because you're selecting for the parent line and the tray that you put in there. So after you've done that a few times, 99.9% .9 of the genome is not from, a, from the GMO. So any unintended effect has got to be in a less and less and less and less and less and less portion of, of, of the, um, the genome. So there's really not much of a prima facie basis for concern and if you were concerned how can you maintain logical consistency by requiring the data requirements that we have for GMOs and not requiring it for conventionally bred crops particularly if you've just stuck them in next to a high radiation source and see what comes out. Let's look at compositional analysis uh, for a moment. If I modify an organism to make the grain's larger. The composition is going to be dramatically different to the parent line because the proportion of the pericarp and you know, all of the other structures around the outside of, of the grain is going to be different because the volume is different. Right? It's all to do with surface area volume sort of ratios. Um, and that will change a whole raft of, of characteristics in terms of the composition of the, um, the modified crop compared to the parent. Now these, this chart, I've, I borrowed a few of these from the Compositional Analysis Workshop and I'd point out that if anybody's interested, the full lectures um, plus the talk over and the slides are available off the IFPIC uh, website. And if you have an interest in this, it is really worth going and having a look at. Um, so this just shows the variation of non-GM plants, plant seven varieties in six locations in a single year. Variation is normal and expected. If you didn't see it, you'd start to worry about the quality of the analysis. This just illustrates the um, effect of back crossing and the reduction of the uh, germplasm from the lead event. The difference between extremes, if you like, in the land races of um, maize is greater than the difference between a human being and a monkey. Okay, this is all natural variation and we're worried about putting a single gene into corn. Right? For all of the jumping genes and the millions of single nucleotide polymorphisms in corn, there has never been a toxic corn. All right? So all this natural variation has never produced a de novo toxin in corn. And yet there are those who propose that the act of inserting a gene through biotechnology creates a risk. The evidence is overwhelmingly against that. All right, so now let's have a look at, uh, quickly at uh, allergen, assessing allergenicity. How much time have I got left? I don't want to overblow it. Six minutes? Yeah, that's okay. All right. These are the sorts of things we ask about allergenicity. I mean, clearly, if you were to introduce an allergen into a plant that wasn't allergenic, uh, it would be a major food safety issue. So what we want to know is, the source of the gene, does it come from a plant that has any evidence of, of allergenicity? Is the new protein nearly identical to a known allergen? So you might get cross-reactivity. That's a challenging question to answer, perhaps. Um, is it a gluten, if it's from wheat or barley or rye? Is there an increased risk the new protein will sensitise de novo? So if it's digested in the gut, clearly the potentiality for uh, sensitisation is, is much less. And it depends on the quantity, too, although thresholds in allergenicity are a bit of a challenge. The other one is greyed out because um, these are issues that have come out of Codex in 2003 and as far as I'm concerned and the Australian Food Authority is concerned, we, we as I've mentioned already can see absolutely no value 
in worrying ourselves about the level of endogenous allergens in the food. And I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that in a second. Um, it's pro it is problematic to predict allergenicity of novel proteins. Uh, in practice, we use various uh, ap approaches. No single criterion is sufficiently predictive of allergenicity or non-allergenicity, so it's sort of a weight of evidence approach. There's a large natural va variation in allergen composition of non-GM soybean varieties as a function of germplasm, environmental factors, and so on. So variation is normal, and variation in endogenous allergens is going to be normal. Now, if the normal variation is four, five, six-fold, um, how do we interpret what, what do we compare against for a start, the GM? And if it's within that range, why would we do anything? But if you are going to concern yourself with a doubling or trebling of the endogenous allergen, why wouldn't you do it with the conventional crops? Right? So you'd require peanuts grown in South America to be tested to be compared with peanuts grown in North America compared to Australia or, or, or wherever. Because if you're worried about that, it's an equally worrisome thing in natural variation as it is in GM. Um, <clears throat> so what, what assessment question, what, in, what risk management question does this information actually, actually answer? Um, clinically, how important is this change? Um, how will the change between the, the GM and its counterpart be interpreted in terms of the food safety assessment? And how much of a change is going to cause you some concern? Now, these um, seeds here are all conventionally bred. Soybeans and soybeans, you know, there are some people who are allergy, have, have an allergy to soy um, protein, and clearly the proportions are going to be different just because of seed size. Right? A whole pile of things are going to be different. You know, the surface area to, to volume ratio of the large seed is much less than the, less, than the smaller seed. Right? So if you do a compositional analysis, you're going to find a very different composition simply because of the size of the seed, not because the genetics are particularly different for the vast majority of characteristics. So here's a question. You want to know the, the level of endogenous allergen. Here's three opportunities. What are you going to do with it? You know, that's what I'd be asking you know, those jurisdictions who want this data. What risk management outcome, what labelling, what cautionary, you know, what, what permissions are you going to change with that data? Well, of course, you can't change any of it. So why ask for it? If it has no value, right, it has no value to the consumer, no value to the regulator, no value to the, the risk manager, why spend the money on it? There must be other things you could spend time and money on. In Australia, we don't require this data um, simply because, to us, if you're allergic to peanuts, you don't eat peanuts. End of story. But it's got twice the number of allergens or half the number of allergens. I'm going to skip through that. Now, another slide taken from the uh, compositional workshop. This looks at the dosing regime for allergenicity tests in people who are allergic, people who will actually have an anaphylactic shock, all right, going to anaphylaxis. And what you see is that the doses are increased by clinicians in a clinical setting by two to three fold. All right, so they think it's perfectly safe to increase two to three fold in somebody who's known to be allergic until you get an effect. So why would we be worrying about a two fold increase if you know, in a testing environment you're going to use you know, significantly greater? All right, so where do we go from here? In my view, it's a little bit of pragmatism. If we come back and say, look, GM food doesn't need risk assessment, you're not going to maintain public confidence, and no regulator on earth is going to, going to agree to that because the political consequences are just not manageable. But corn, for crying out loud, has got a huge history of genetic variation. Never has shown itself to be toxic. We've got a lot of events in corn. Never has it shown a problem. So maybe we could approve corn genetically modified corn generically. So this comes back to the analogies with uh, radiation, irradiation of food, where you start to get some generic approvals. Now, if that's too big a leap forward, well, corn's been engineered with BT and uh, glyphosate tolerance and glufosinate tolerance. Maybe we can approve the event, right, the, the, the transgene and the crop as a start. So corn, which has been genetically modified with you know, the BT gene. Generically. Anybody can do it. It's pre-approved. Because the evidence for that being safe is overwhelming. I think picking crop by crop and transgene by transgene, there is some potential to get at least people to listen to you. 
So with that, I think I might uh, draw it to a close in the interest of time, but I'm happy to, to, to take questions on any of that.